I'm Chris. I'm Natasha. I'm Pete. I'm Keith. I'm Dave. And this is the Automation Village. And welcome to the May edition of the Automation Village. Now, today's episode is all about data validation. So modern automation systems produce mountains and mountains <laughs> and mountains of data. Three mountains. Three mountains of data. And I mean, it can't all be good. Right. So over the next 40 minutes, we're going to talk about uh, some of the strategies that people use to help ensure that they can trust what their industrial systems are telling them. We're going to also have a SCADA tip and trick from Dave. We'll have our usual automation roundtable. And back by popular demand, we're going to do a giveaway. So do not leave us too soon. But first, we're going to go all the way to Scotland to talk to Keith with the news. Hey, Keith, good to see you. What's all the news? Well, this month we're starting in space once again. Nice. Uh, the o Orbital Assembly Corporation, the OEC, uh, they are the only company developing the first commercially viable space-based business park with gravity. Uh, they've announced plans for their Pioneer class station, the first free-flying, habitable, privately operated facility in orbit. Now, the Pioneer class are the world's first and largest hybrid space stations for both work and stay. Uh, these custom customizable environments will feature five spacious uh, modules built around OEC's rotating gravity ring architecture. Pioneer's artificial gravity features will enhance the level of comfort in space. So uh, I think this is a true fact I read somewhere uh, that all the housekeeping for this hotel is going to be done by the old Canada arms left over from the space shuttle program. Is that right? <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. I guess they could be used to deliver <laughs> want to room service. <laughs> um, a basic station model that accommodates 28 guests will provide a hybrid environment of microgravity, that's zero G, and variable levels of gravity up to 0.57 G. Uh, custom configurations are possible to accommodate more people or to meet specific commercial equipment specifications. And each Pioneer module will offer up to 14,000 cubic feet of space. Uh, How do you fancy spending some time in that hotel, Natasha? Well, let me tell you, as soon as they add a ballroom, we'll host BT Skata Fest. You've heard it here first, Sweet. folks. <laughs> All right, awesome. what's next? Well, up next, uh, an event, uh, Pwn to Own uh, Miami 2022 has wrapped up and it was an amazing three days of competition. Uh, the event run by the Zero Day Initiative, ZDI, uh, pitches researchers against critical infrastructure software and control systems to try and find vulnerabilities uh, in real time on a stage. In total, $400,000 uh, wow. of awards were given out for 26 unique zero-day exploits. Okay, so for the benefit of my dad, who never misses an episode, uh, could you tell us what exactly is a zero-day exploit? Sure. Well, hello, Chris's dad. Um, <laughs> a a zero-day vulnerability is a vulnerability in a system or device that has been disclosed but is not yet patched. An exploit that attacks a zero-day vulnerability is called a zero-day exploit. And um, because they were identified uh, or because they were discovered before the security researchers and software developers became aware of them and before they can, uh, can issue a patch, zero-day vulnerabilities pose a higher risk to users. Um, cyber criminals race to exploit these vulnerabilities to cash in on their schemes. Vulnerable systems are exposed until a patch is issued by the vendor. And zero-day um, zero vulnerabilities are typically involved in targeted attacks. How many campaigns still use, um, sorry, I should say, however, uh, many campaigns still use old vulnerabilities. Um, the Zero Day Initiative was designed to encourage the reporting of zero day vulnerabilities privately to the affected vendors um, by financially rewarding these researchers. At the time, uh, there's a perception that uh, some of the information security industry 
uh, suspect that these um, researchers are, are malicious hackers, but in fact, very many of them are, are not. And indeed, the majority uh, are uh, actual researchers trying to improve security of these systems. The vendors are given uh, 120 days uh, before uh, the information about the vulner vulnerabilities are released uh, to the general public. Right, so essentially now we're just paying people to wear a white hat rather than a black hat. That, that's exactly right, Natasha, exactly right. All right, what, what else do you have for us, Keith? Uh, well, uh, I read an interesting article from Chris Foote uh, from Radix Bay, and he was giving eight steps to improve your organization's uh, data quality uh, in a proactive way uh, before data errors and other issues uh, cause business problems. So establishing and maintaining high levels of data quality is a constant challenge for organizations. And the unbridled growth in the amounts of data that they're generating makes that task more difficult. The use of data to help uncover new business insights and drive effective decision making is also increasing at a rapid pace. As a result, right. IT and data management teams are contending with more data that is more important to their organizations. So uh, the problem is compounded uh, these days because there's so many more places to put it. We've got all this data. Uh, we don't have to worry about uh, you know, controlling it because we can put it in the cloud and we've got all the space in the world. So this is, uh, this is a good opportunity to, to revisit that. Absolutely. And I mean, one thing that everybody can agree on uh, in the IT is the, is the adage of garbage in, garbage out. It succinctly states that the informal rule that the quality of the information produced by a computer process depends on the quality of the data that it uses. So if incorrect data is input, then the output will also be incorrect. And that's why good data quality is so important to organizations. Data quality measures the condition of data elements to identify issues and assesses their overall level of truth. That enables an organization to judge whether data is fit for its intended purpose and can be relied on for decision making. That's great. So I'm going to take all of these eight tips. I'm going to put them over later on the form, along with the two other articles that Keith brought to us uh, this month. So make sure you check over there later for links to that. But Keith, don't go too far. I want to stick around because I want to bring you back later on to do questions with Nat. I've got a good one for you. In today's tip, we're going to be looking at input boxes. Now, input boxes are kind of a tricky subject because everything that I'm going to tell you is really based on personal preference. So if you don't agree with what I say today, no problem at all. But I think that you'll find some of it helpful. Now, the input box is basically where you type something into VT SCADA, that data gets passed into a tag, and that tag typically passes that data off to a PLC or something. Now, in VT SCADA itself, the input boxes typically look something like this. So we've got a speed set point here, we've got a ramp speed, we've got a current limit, we've got a voltage limit. So obviously this is all about setting parameters in our XFOS 9000 motor. I'm sure you guys are all using this. And if we wanna change the speed, then we can just put in say 1300, hit enter, and write that value out to the PLC. We can also change the ramp speed, say to 25, and we can tab out of that. We can change the current limit to 20 and click down into the next box. And we can take a look at the voltage limit and we can change that to say uh, 2200. And we'll just close that to write those values. So you can see there, 1300, 25, 20, and 2200, all written to the PLC. Now, if we go back to the PLC, and I wanted to change the speed set point back to 1500. Now you notice that when I change the voltage limit, I just click close and that change was applied. Well, with the 1500, if I click a space that isn't a clickable element in VT SCADA, then what I'm gonna find is that I'm not actually writing that value. I have to actually click into a box or on a button or something. And where we see people sometimes make a mistake here is that they'll change a the set point and then they'll click the X up top and that won't actually write that out to the PLC. And it's for this reason that sometimes I think that having this close button here is a little bit dangerous because I'd expect this and this to really have the same um, 
the same action, the same consequence. So the fact they're a little bit different, I would eliminate your close button and just have this. And then what I would add is simply put in what the set points are so you can see when it's different. So if I change this to 1500, I can see that it isn't actually 1500 until I've done something to actually write that out to the PLC. So that in itself makes a pretty big difference. But there's another thing here. If I was to change this prompt to say 600, then I might realize like, oh, I really should have changed that ramp speed before I wrote that speed set point. So what I would propose to you is that you move on from that basic strategy and then you make things slightly more complex for yourselves by writing this cached set point. So now my set point, you can see here, I've got some previous things cached, but my set point here, I could change the motor. Let's just write these out so that we get this base point here. So the idea is that I have cache values and so I could change this to 1300. I could change the ramp speed back to 25 and I could change the current limit to say 30 and a voltage, let's just leave it the same. So what's neat about this is because I'm using tags as my cache and I've got tags as my set point, it's really easy to write these expressions to compare the two and also create little indicators to let you know what's going on. So in this case, I've also replaced that close button with a write to PLC button. So you saw I'm able to change all these parameters and it's not until I write to the PLC that they're actually changed. The other thing that I can do is if I change this, say, to 1600, you can see here the little indicator says that I'm ready to write that. I can close this window right out and I can go back into it and that 1600 is held because it's held in memory. So we can write that out to the PLC. So how do we do this? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. So what I've got is my Zyphos 9000 pump here, and you can see my different IO points that I have for that pump, but I've added one extra piece here. So I put in this little cache, which is written in a multi-write tag, and inside of that cache, I've just put my values here as analog memory tags. And the analog memory, if you're not so sure, basically you just write an IO and calc tag, you set up the data type the way that you'd want to use it, do not click that it's a calculation, and in the IO tab, do not put a read address, do not put a write address, and then that tag will be set up as a memory tag, and you'll know it because it'll all say mem here, where your normal tags will say in, out, or in, out. And so the other thing to look at is how we actually set up the um, IO tag, or sorry, the multi-write tag here. And the multi-write tag's pretty easy. So the first thing is the activation. You don't really have to do anything with the activation and I'll show you how to draw that a little bit later because VTSkate has a built-in widget to activate this. Um, the other thing you can do here is create this write list and this is basically where you take all of those memory tags and you map them to the tags that you want to write to. And in this case, it's pretty easy. They had essentially the same names, um, just in a slightly different place in the tag tree. From there, you're gonna just take your thing, go draw, and pick the uh, tag that you want and then draw it on your page. So there's your two, two types of pop-up. Let me know um, which one you like. Um, and also let me know if you have questions on how I did anything with this, please put those down in the comments or in the chat for this video. And we'll be sure to either post in the comments or get back to you directly with uh, an answer to your question. Thanks very much. Welcome to another round table. And as usual, I'm joined by Lee Kibler from Riviera Utilities, Inge Schmerzler from Dispel, and myself. <laughs> so good to see you guys. So <laughs> I had this thought uh, when we were thinking about this whole episode. And one of the things that came into my head was to do with AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, digital transformation, digital twins, all of this stuff that, that we're presented with. And in particular, I kind of zoned in on bias. And I guess my, my thought was that bias can be in an algorithm, in an AI, you know, engine as much as it can be in, uh, in humans. And 
I, I, you know, had spoken with the with uh, a few people offline about this documentary that I saw. It, it was a short documentary, and it was to do with how humans become blind to different things, mostly due to assumption. But it's it's a uh, it's our own cognitive biases that we we stop to see patterns. And for anyone who's into flying or anything like that, what I saw was it was an aircraft that had three pitot tubes. So this is. Uh, for measuring airspeed, and mm -hmm. the, and this very good plane it was an Airbus uh, a, a, an A three thirty I believe, um, that was there, and the the covers were left on over these for various different reasons to to stop insects going into the the pitot tubes, so they had three to give you triple redundancy. Okay, amongst other systems, three, and what actually happened was the pilots took off even though there was, I think it was six full counts of six individuals that came out and looked at the Peter tubes that had huge streamers that were two or three feet long that said, remove before flight on the nose of the aircraft and everyone missed it. The plane took off, no airspeed indication and they managed because of other redundant systems, they were able to land the plane. Um, and I'll put that link in the forum. But anyway, maybe maybe you, uh, Ian, just to, to kick things off, if that's right. Uh, what are your thoughts about AI and bias? Uh, this is the most civilized version of the many rumbles that the three of us have had on this topic over the past <laughs> few days. So in my opinion, you there's a, a t-shirt that I grew up with, which said confidence is that feeling that you have before you fully understand the situation you're getting into. The other one that I've heard is experience is that thing that you get by doing something that should have killed you. When it comes to an algorithm that, or an AI, if you wish to call it that, if first, if it's an AI, by definition, it's something that is learning over time. And that means it's got a Bayesian based software under, excuse me, statistical package underlying it. When you think about the people that you've hired and you think of how well trained they are after a month versus three months versus a year and what level of experience they have, it should be no surprise that if you take an algorithm that is pulling in sensor data or being informed by some other means, over time it should become more experienced. But if you pass it only a, a very narrowly framed set of data, it will by definition become biased in that fashion. So whose fault is that? And do you necessarily need to have an algorithm which is purely informed upon forward data? If everyone's saying, well, it'll never remember or re be able to respond correctly to that thing that happened before, well, maybe you should have pass it some historical data. Now, all of this doesn't mean that I'm, I'm an advocate or, or saying that AI is not biased. I'm saying, of course, it's, it'll be biased if the data that's passed to it is I'll finish there for the moment. Well, I'd like to pick up from there with, uh, has anybody in the audience ever been involved in a large software deployment where you're trying to solve problems? And you have a, a large group of people and you're all these different compartments of the software are, are responsible for performing different functions and all those functions are interrelated. And then uh, this software is, is uh, you, you take all these people's problems and you have these lists of problems and you put them into this gigantic list and they all interreact as the consultant goes out and develops these algorithms and different modules and you put it all together and then guess what? It doesn't work. And you end up having a uh, inferior product that requires in the end more labor and more time and more pain because we didn't define the processes on the front end. We didn't design mm -hmm. the business solution to solve the problem. The algorithm is not representative of the true problems that we're dealing with. And it, it's very, very frustrating. And uh, I think as a whole in industry, we all try to solve the same problems over and over and over again in different worlds. And uh, and we, we can't move ahead uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the world of like artificial intelligence because everybody has their own thought process. Their problem is theirs and theirs alone. 
So how do we move our industry forward? Uh, not only the water and wastewater industry, but in manufacturing and, and others to, to, to learn the lessons of, of the problems across industries to, to solve the problem once and solve it well without having to reinvent the wheel all the time. What do you guys think about, about that inference? <laughs> I think that's I'm smarter without a beard. Am I smarter without a beard or with a beard? Uh, both. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, I, I'm fully with you, Ian, as well. By the way, and on the whole idea of, um, of you know, exposing kind of an algorithm as much as people to more experiences, and you could say that uh, an AI type engine has a greater chance of doing that because humans get bored looking at stuff, whereas uh, an AI technically doesn't, doesn't get bored. But I would still say that there's, you know, if the human isn't aware, and, and, the, uh, and another example that came to mind, which uh, it was funny, it popped up when, when I was kind of thinking about this, was that if your only exposure to, uh, to dogs were chihuahuas and little terriers, and suddenly you were presented with a Great Dane. Um, you might think that the Great Dane is either huge or a horse. So, um, so, so you could say, yeah, well, all you have to do is you have to expose the, the, the learning engine or the person or whatever to, to that. So how do you think, you know, how do you get around that, that form of bias? And, and I know, again, lots of data, but how do you actually do that in a practical sense, Ian? So this problem shows up a lot in cybersecurity, so it, but it, it's under a different name as the pattern of life attack. So one of two things will frequently happen. A good example is you'll have firewalls that aren't actually what the marketing person says and they aren't actually AI based. The other problem is you do occasionally encounter ones that are AI based, but they were written in a jiffy. So we're going to address both of those in, in turn. So the first one, you have something that's been built to detect any pre-known, any virus that was already known, but it's defined very specifically because they hate it when you get a false flag and the result is that someone's yelling at you because the program didn't run. So as an attacker, what you do is you say, right, fine, you know that this virus shouldn't, it, this is a virus with this string. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change one number or something inside of the whole payload and throw it in and the firewall says, well, that's fine. It's not on my list. On the other end of the spectrum, you have ones that say the world changes over time. If it looks roughly like this or it behaves roughly like this, it should be allowed in. And a classic problem happens with nature impacting the system. So you start to get a leak that steadily turns a flood, but because the system is built to steadily evolve what it's seeing on the camera screen, it never trips an alarm because it's steadily seeing that. The same thing is how you launch an attack. So how do you deal with that? Well, because eventually the quote horse will walk through versus seeing a dog. The way you do that from a practical perspective is you add something called framing. So you look at different periods of time and you check to see whether or not you've had a, a proper distributional shift between those two time periods versus a steady learning curve. And then you have a human check to see, well, what caused that? And is that indeed something normal? So that's a different, that would lead into a conversation about alarming and when an alarm should go off to bring in a human to assist. Very good. What about you, Lee? Well, I mean, in, in, in our world, we tend to, our biases are our experience. So we, 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 we look and, and we see a pattern uh, on an HMI or on a, on a controller and we just, we use our experience to guide us. And, and the one in a million things are what get us. I mean, it's like we did never anticipate uh, this problem coming along and then we have to put that in a collective database which is our minds and then our minds retire and there's a whole new generation of people that come behind us and they have to learn the same lessons over and over again because they're, you know we've got common reoccurring you know high levels in a, in a wet well of a lift station or or you know a well does not run when called but uh, but you know a weird ORP value in a water plant or something like that that could be some one in a million occurrence. 
you know, that kind of is going to, that's going to miss our internal algorithm. That's where these tools that are being worked on uh, in your world, Ian and, and Peter, are going to greatly improve our efficiency you know, as end users. Great points, absolutely. Well, guys, we're out of time. This is a topic we could speak, I think, and have a great discussion on for an hour or more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I think some of what we try and do is we we try and get it on the forum, um, you know, and and uh, if any of you are interested, you know, as viewers and and you want to engage with some of this, it's a, it's a hot topic. Um, I'm, you know, I I was jokingly saying to. Uh, to Ian and Lee earlier that uh, I probably wouldn't still sit in the back of a certain autonomous car yet and feel comfortable that uh, that it's fully trained AI. But that doesn't mean I'm not open to AI. I actually am, um, but uh, but I'm, I'm cautionary. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Ian, Lee, thank you so much again and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you guys next month. Always, Always good, yeah. Be well. Today, I'm here in my garden, and if you're like me, then you like to optimize things around the house. And right now, I'm looking at this tiny little inexpensive greenhouse. Now, where I'm in Canada, the days are quite nice, but the evenings are getting quite cool still. And I'm trying to take this little greenhouse and get my seeds started as early as possible. So the first thing that I've done is laid some bricks in the bottom of the greenhouse to try to retain some of that nighttime or some of that daytime heat, and then let it out at night and keep things a little bit warmer than they might have otherwise been. But the other thing that we can do is add an ounce of technology and for that I'm going to use my Wemos uh, microcontroller with the temperature and pressure head and the other side of it is I'm going to use the VT SCADA power brick with the integrated solar panel. So for those of you who attended VT SCADA Fest a few years ago you'll be very familiar with this. I don't know if we still give these out but I know that mine has become very useful and I use it all the time. So all I'm really going to do here is plug A into B and I've already got the microprocessor program to connect to my home Wi-Fi and running MQTT we're going to transmit the temperature and the humidity out to a broker and that broker is going to then transmit into my SCADA software to do the uh, trending, reporting and things like that on the information to make sure that these seeds are going to stay in a good place. Now of course for that SCADA software. I'm running this on a home computer. I need to run it all the time. I don't feel like buying SCADA software, so I'm going to use VT SCADA Lite. Now, VT SCADA Lite, if you don't know, is good for up to 50 I.O. It gives you full development, all the drivers. Um, it gives you the ability to write reports and use a thin client. You just can't use that thin client over the internet, but you can use it sort of on your local network or in a, a local WAN or something like that. If you have an application that you think you could optimize something around your house, then please take a look at VT SCADA Lite. It's free and it's fantastic. Camera on, mic on, spot on. Over the last few years, we've made a number of these short documentaries. And uh, what I find most challenging, especially when I'm working by myself, is how do I remember to get all the details right, that each and every one of them makes such a difference to the quality of the end product, especially out in the real world where there's so many more variables and distractions. So today I'm trying out a technique that was actually invented by the Japanese for their rail system uh, to help me get everything right. And along the way, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how strategies like this can help to avoid uh, mistakes that are caused by automation bias. But first. In the late 90s, my wife and I worked in Japan. Uh, I was teaching in the city of Koryama, uh, working at companies like Matsushita Denko, uh, Hitachi. On Fridays, I actually got to ride the bullet train one stop to teach a course at Panasonic. Now on the weekends, I uh, hopped on a local train to go uh, visit my wife who was uh, working down in Hitachi City. And of course, every now and again, we'd hop on a train down to Tokyo and explore the city via their excellent rail system. All this is to say, we rode a lot of trains. We often noticed that the rail staff would conduct themselves in this very formalized way that we just assumed was uh, part of their excellent customer service. In fact, it wasn't until I was working on this project uh, that I learned what exactly it meant. It's called Shisa Kanko. 
pointing, and calling. This occupational safety method was designed to help workers reduce mistakes by pointing at important indicators and calling out their status. It was developed in Japan in the 1900s for their growing fleet of steam locomotives, and now it's used around the world in a variety of industries. A study by the Japanese Railway Technical Research Institute found that the combination of gesturing at points of interest while calling out the objective for each one could reduce errors up to 85%. Now, this may seem like a very quaint way of doing something for which technology would be better suited. I mean, this is a show about automation after all. And as many of you know, the world is full of situations where the rigorousness of a machine needs to be tempered by the judgment of a human. It's this judgment that brings us to today's topic, automation bias. As our world increasingly leans on automation-based decision-making for things like healthcare, industry, automation, the more this kind of bias can become problematic. Errors resulting from automation bias usually occur in situations where you have a machine that is in the primary role of decision maker and a human who is there as an observer and failsafe. There are two types of errors associated with automation bias. Commission errors occur when users follow an automated system's advice without considering other sources of information. For example, the panel may say that the train is ready to leave the station. However, some debris has partially covered the tracks, and the train can't test for this. Pointing to the tracks ahead and calling out the status would catch this problem. Omission errors happen when automated systems fail to spot a problem and the human doesn't notice because they're not paying close enough attention. For example, the system may show that all train doors have closed, yet a diligent scan of the length of the train shows that one of them is blocked open by something. Unless you made a point of pointing at each door, you could easily miss it. Pointing and calling is not the only way to mitigate automation bias. The real takeaway here is that somewhere in your critical process, there's a person waiting for an automated system to make a mistake. And odds are, they're either highly distracted or highly bored. They might be grateful for a new way to keep their eye on the ball. I don't know if this is your favorite part of the show, but it's my favorite part of the show because I'm going to try and stump my colleagues. So this one came in under after last month's episode and knowing what we were going to talk about in this episode, I thought this was the perfect one to keep for you. Well so here we go. Okay. I don't use VT SCADA, mm. but I have to keep offloading historical data when I run out of disk space. How do I ensure that my historian is only recording meaningful data? Ah, very good question. And right on message. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing you need to understand is that VT SCADA, uh, if you were using VT SCADA, you should never have to back off data uh, or, or upgrade your, your hard drive all the time. It's uh, Because we have a built-in historian, it's very efficient. It shouldn't be choking up your hard drive. So if there is a problem, that's usually because of one of two things. One is that your polling rate is higher than you need it to be. So that's the rate at which which your, uh, uh, your HMI or your historian is actually recording values that come in uh, from your sensors or your various I.O. So I would go in and look at that. Odds are it's turned way up because somebody by default decided more data, good. Uh, the other thing is uh, dead banding. So uh, not all data is meaningful. This is a, a real data quality thing. So for example, imagine the surface of a lake and the wind is blowing across the surface and it's just kind of rippling up and down where the sensor is. That data is not useful to anybody, but, it's, but it can certainly fill your hard drive. So uh, VT SCADA uses a thing called a dead band uh, for the historian. So basically it says any values uh, that are less than this much of a difference or change, don't bother with that. And that does that goes a long way. And you need to go in and set that up. It takes a few seconds. And actually, it, upcoming in 12.1, uh, we'll actually have another form of dead banding, which is on the PLC itself. Uh, so by by doing the same process at the PLC level, not only are you not filling up your historian, uh, you are also uh, saving on your communications bandwidth because that's an important priority where you've got more and more data coming in from more and more sites. And also it reduces the actual CPU load on the PCs themselves. So I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, let me know. Um, 
And producer Pete, if you're there, if you could bring Keith back on, because I've got a good one for him. Hey, okay. Keith. All right. So Tim, who uh, is a VT SCADA regional manager in New England in the Northeast United States. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. Was at the Maryland Rural Water Conference last week, and he was asked in his booth, and I thought it would be a good one to bring to you, Keith. A, because you're really smart. B, because you're going to a trade show. Um, our system is not huge, but our team struggles to manage all the high level and critical alarms that are configured. How do we better manage alarms so we don't miss something important? Uh, that's, that is also a great question and probably a question that we get asked quite a lot of the time. Um, so in short, the uh, best thing to do is take a look at the ISA 18.2 alarm standard. Now, this is a, a standard which uh, describes how to manage your alarms. Um, and VT Skater has some really neat built-in tools to help you do that and analyze it. So uh, some of the tools can uh, allow you to see the distribution of the alarm priority. So you can see how many critical alarms, how many warning alarms, and see uh, how those are set up across your system and how they are um, affecting the operators, how many of those uh, alarms are coming in during particular times. You can also identify rapidly some uh, bad actors. So these are nuisance alarms that keep re-triggering. Um, and there's tools there as well to allow alarm shelving. So these are uh, in situations where you're, there's a known piece of equipment that might be either faulty or being in service. Um, you still want to record those alarms. You still want that information to be recorded in the historian and so, such like. Um, um, but you don't want them to be disturbing the operator uh, in their day-to-day -day operations. So uh, in short, the, the ISA 18.2 alarm standard is a really good place to start there uh, to try and optimize the alarms over your SCADA system. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, send us your questions any way you want to, email, social media, uh, courier pigeon, whatever you want to do, get them to me because I love trying to stump these guys. So make sure you get your questions to me. And if Pete, if you wanted to join us back on, I think we're going to close out the show. So before we come to the end, I just want to thank a few people, Lee Kibler from Riviera Utilities and Ian Schmertzler from Dispel. And that brings us to my favorite segment, which is things we say at the end of the show. Uh, so we'll throw over to you, Natasha. What do you have to say? Right, so at the top of the show, I promised you we were gonna do a giveaway. And so that is this time now. Last month, we gave away some limited edition Automation Village t-shirts. We've still got some left, so we wanna spread the wealth. We wanna send these out to you. So email me right now, natasha.lutz at trihedral.com. We'll also be over in the chat. Email me your address and your t-shirt size, and we're gonna get those t-shirts out to you. Producer Pete, what say you? Just very simply, make sure you hit that subscribe button on all our different social media channels like uh, YouTube, hit subscribe, and make sure that you visit our forum. There's lots and lots and lots of info on that, so uh, make sure you do that too. Keith, final remarks from Scotland? Yes, well, if you require a certificate of attendance for your per professional development, uh, Natasha has a link for you over on our forum. Excellent. Uh, thank you, everybody. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the marvelous world of data validation, and we look forward to seeing you in June. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.